Ready? I'm ready. Oh Rolling. I'm gonna start writing Dec down. I want your list of how Apple decreases your. I'm, I'm gonna, yes, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna make a list. I dropped this phone once, just once. And this is this is the second time. Never broken, even if I did drop it, right? Never broken an Android. This, Never broke a Tonka truck either. That don't mean to make it a better I, Mattel. I broke just this, I, I, I dropped this. Are you kidding? This is the second time. I was like, after that, me and Apples were done. I was like, this when this phone dies, it dies, and I'm never going back to Apple again. <laughs> so guys, um, we're here with two techies at CIC Venture Cafe. Two techies on the Thursdays with tapas or drinks or beer or whatever. And, um, this is the beautiful Mikhail Solomon that's obviously telling you why iPhones aren't good products for her productivity and her world. So. Since we're having that beautiful conversation to start us off, um, Mikhail, why don't you tell us, when did you fall in love with technology? Uh, I think I've been using technology my whole entire life in ways where I didn't really perceive that I was using technology, but I was raised in, in, the, in the 1990s when technology was like really on, on, the, on the upswing. You know, we, we learned, I think, what was the first computer I used? I think Mac was the first computer. I, you remember the box, yes. the box Macs? That was the first um, computer I learned on, and okay. then I started using Dells more frequently. Um, so you were dialing up with your AOL free disk in the free hours? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, me, I remember the noise, <laughs> where you had to wait Hitting everybody before up. you logged onto the internet. I'm going to change my name next <laughs> yeah. week. It's yeah, gonna, yeah, yeah. It's going to be Michael Hall 23. Exactly. The 22 about to expire when this disc run out. And I still have my AOL account, actually, oddly, but I don't use it anymore. I have it, but I forgot my password. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't used it in like 12 years, so they might have taken it from me. Mm -hmm. um, so, the basis of it, and I know I had to coerce you into this conversation, um, we're actually talking about tech and innovation. Mm -hmm. So I think you have a very innovative project that you're working on with Prism Group. So before we get into all my crazy questions, why don't you just kind of tell everybody that's watching us exactly what Prism is. Okay. Um, so Prism is essentially an art fair um, similar to a lot of the art fairs that people might be familiar with, like Art Basel and Scope and Untitled, etc. That, f but it has a specific focus on African and African diaspora contemporary art. Okay. Um, it was started in 2013 here okay. in Miami, and uh, we have a long-term goal of, of course, building the brand here in Miami, but then also expanding into other markets beyond Miami. So what do you think, outside of the growing art market and the billions of dollars that are exchanged that week during Art Basel, what's the, I guess, the innovative part? What's the edge to what Prism brings to the table? Um, I think what makes us innovative is that we're kind of opening or creating a space for otherwise um, unseen artists that and also creating um, a new a new feeder for artists who don't necessarily have immediate access to the global arts market so in that sense I think um, it, it gives um, a lot of artists who, who want the visibility and who want a, a space to really show um, their work at a world-class level the opportunity to really access those eyes and those ears um, and then we also are really trying to figure out how to make Prism a platform beyond it just being an art fair. Like, right. um, art fairs kind of, they, they travel, they, but, but they're just that, they're just art fairs. But So would you get into like the aspect of selling? Would you become like a online curator? I know curation is one of your specialties. Um, curatorial, I mean, I think art fairs do that already. They, you know, they, well, a lot of them invite curators to participate in mm -hmm. their art fairs. Um, we already sell work. I sell work beyond the art fair as well. But would you sell it on an online platform? Like, how would you expand? Right. So we actually just this past 2016 started, created an online portal to sell the work nice. that um, 
the work that might not sell in the actual physical space is still available for purchase and we created an online site for, for those for those works. Do you know Tara Reed? Tara Reed? Tara Reed with Collecto. Shout out to Tara Reed. No, I don't. Mm -hmm. You should look her up. Tara Reed with Collecto. She has a platform where she sells art online mm -hmm. based off of like almost like a cognitive learning of is that the client itself. Collecto with a K, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I've, I've heard of the platform, but I haven't actually met. I want to her. introduce you to her. She's in Chicago, so you cool. know her. Nice. Dope. So mm -hmm. we are in Miami. Um, the things that really matter. Mm -hmm. Favorite beer, favorite craft beer, your favorite cocktail. Mm -hmm. What's your go-to? Favorite beer is Trappist. Um, what's the second word? Trappist something with the R. Okay. But it's a, anything Belgian. Okay. Is essentially what I like. There's Trappist, there's ABT12, St. Barnabas. Nice. Um, Chimay Blue and Red are great. So those are probably three beers that I definitely, not, they're not even beers, they're like amazing stouts that feel like Christmas when you drink them. Um, that <laughs> was a tweet. Wow. <laughs> An amazing stout that feels like Christmas when, when you, you drink, drink them. them. Right. I'm making that a shirt. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what those beers are. Um, and then my favorite wine, you said? Or what was it? Just favorite cocktail, but you, yeah, I, I, I think you really did it with the craft beer. I yeah, mean, yeah. that's what we really care about. Okay. I mean, timeline Brewery, we care about, you know, all beers yeah. matter. You know, that's yeah. where we're at. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> See, why'd you have to go there, Michael? Because <laughs> I'm a rebel. That's right. what we just talked about. Uh -huh. um, so if your business life was based off of a movie mm -hmm. or a TV show, would that be yes Ooh. tv show tv show or a movie like right now i'm in part two of love jones hmm. i know because you got the whole love thing going <laughs> on but for me i think it's um i think it would be I, I, don't, I haven't found a movie yet. Like for for the for you where could be a TV I'm, show series. For where I am right now at this right now at this moment in my life, I don't feel like there's any movie. So we got to make one. Yeah, I, like where I am right now. I mean, I would say like, mate, what was the movie that they did about the guy from Facebook, um, Mark Zuckerberg? That movie that they did on his life. I know what you're talking about. I don't. I don't remember it. I can't remember the name of it. But the Mark Zuckerberg um, by biography movie maybe that but even even that is not directly related related because i mean i am a person who's starting her own business okay. and so i guess so right now being in miami what do you feel are some of your biggest challenges that you're going through with your startup um right now tech is the focus <clears throat> in miami and it's not really helpful for particular, and the arts is, has always been difficult to fundraise for, right? Right. So funding for for the arts in Miami is complicated because getting people in Miami to understand the importance of arts. It's hard to teach people the value of arts. It's mm -hmm. also hard to teach people the value of collecting art. I mm -hmm. think the historical value. You have a a culture shift that you almost have to go into. Mm -hmm. um, art is not just a place where you show up and drink free right. beer, free wine. Exactly. It's a lot that goes behind it. Mm -hmm. yeah, you have a challenge ahead of you. Right. See, now you know why I'm interviewing you. Right. You know, right. Right. Um, but on your technical side, you know how you're going to accomplish that. But with the galleries, like, what is it going to take for us to see the Prism Gallery? Like, what do you feel that you're not getting from the community? Or what do you need from the community to really push your efforts forward? Um, I, I mean, I need people to show up when, I mean, I don't recall seeing you at PRISM this year. I was there when you were talking to the young lady in the okay. corner. I walked by you seven times. Okay. And I have witnesses. Okay. And I took flyers from the event. Because I know people like you like to say that stuff. But, I was there. Okay. Okay. I came down through Little Haiti. I parked my Dante car. Dante didn't show up this time around. He was there last year, though, so I'll give Dante that. <laughs> Calling out the camera, man. Oh, okay. But, um, but so it's, a, it's just essentially people just need to show, show up. up. And um, because, you know, the arts has a lot to do with critical mass too. Like when people come to events, people feel motivated to continue coming. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and it's just word of mouth. Like if you know people who do collect artwork, um, like I need my community to be an advocate for 
purchasing work from the space, right? And also, when people purchase from our from our from from Prism, you know that it's benefiting artists of color. Right. right? There's no other there's there's no other um, venture like this in this space that's doing that. Like I literally patronize artists in Miami as well as outside of Miami, New York, Chicago. Yeah, because you did some work with Russell Simmons. Yeah, so, yeah. We, we, we've been partners with them for, with, with, with Danny Simmons, that's mm -hmm. his brother, with Danny and his um, Rush Philanthropic Arts Foundation for the past three years. And um, they have been really supportive. So that would bring me to the next point, because we've already addressed the issues of diversity and you're very targeted on people of color in the mm -hmm. arts. What do you think when you hear, because I've always said this to people, diversity and inclusion is not just a problem in technology. Mm -hmm. It's a problem mm -hmm. in almost every sector of mm -hmm. anything that's big money. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a new, this is one of the newer problems. Mm -hmm. So when you hear the words diversity and inclusion, what comes to your mind? Like, what do you think we need to fix right now? Um, I think, I think there has to, of course, be an acknowledgement that there aren't enough people of color um, sitting in positions where they have the power to advocate for diversity, right? So we're going back to that executive role. Right, the ex executive. But what, what is really um, encouraging, particularly in the art space, is that there are a lot, I mean, just this year alone, I saw in 2016, they, that they appointed a lot of chief curatorial positions to um, people of color. Don't we have a person of color over Pam right now? Yeah, Franklin Sermons is our director, mm -hmm. um, the director of Studio Museum of Harlem, Thelma Golden, and she's been running that ship for quite a, at least a decade now. Um, I think her her curator um, that was at Studio Museum just got a chief curatorial role at I want to say Crystal Bridges Museum, which is in Middle America. Okay. Can't remember exactly what city it's in. Um, another young la lady named Kimberly Gant just got a fellowship at the Chrysler Museum in Norfolk, Virginia. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of people. So now that you see the space. problem, if you had to put a plan in a place, let's mm -hmm. just say you and ten other people get to come together, and somehow from this video, mm -hmm. somebody sees it, and they're just enlightened. Mm -hmm. Or most of the time, people know the solution. Mm -hmm. But if you saw a solution in sight to fix this problem, what would the solution look like? Um, more people of color being um, appointed to board positions at museums, um, becoming members of their board of trustees. So if you are a person who has the financial means, um, making sure that you are an advocate for diversity on, on boards, like you know, like in spaces like Young Arts and spaces like Pam and spaces. So basically, don't just get there, but get there, show up, speak out. Right. I mm -hmm. see what you're saying. Because mm -hmm. it does seem like we have a lot of people that get in those positions and they they don't right. really fix the problems that they went in there mm -hmm. hoping to accomplish. I mean, and it's not to say that it's easy because right. I mean, if it's always going to be a challenge. It's always going to be a challenge, and if if you are the only person there, you're you're right. also right. you're also outspoken. If everybody, if you're the only person who's of color, but has an agenda that's diversity driven. Because so as an artist myself down here, I've never felt a high level of acceptance. Mm -hmm. It always seems to be mm -hmm. a separation. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's black art and there's this art. And mm -hmm. it's just like the inclusiveness there is definitely missing. Mm -hmm. It seems like some people- Everything still kind of operates in a silo, right? right. Like you still have, you know, like they want to build a Latin American museum. Like why do we need a Latin American museum in Miami when you have Pam that essentially does collect a lot of Perez art, art, yeah. Perez, yeah. Perez art Museum. <laughs> um, it wasn't that originally, it's just that their, bene their largest benefactor mm -hmm. it happens to be um, George Perez. But um, I mean, I personally am not an advocate of building a building for every single ethnic background, right? <laughs> right? Like there has to, there has to come a, a, a time. And I think that's necessary, people feel it's necessary because diversity isn't a real, it's conceptual right now. Mm. Diversity is just conceptual, but nobody's actually That's trying to be <laughs> trying to be diverse, right? Um, and you know what? We were twenty fifteen. Mm -hmm. Diversity, inclusion, black and tech, all these things were so powerful. Mm -hmm. To me, it felt like twenty sixteen. Mm -hmm. Those things just kind of died away, and it just wasn't the same. The conversation stopped. I can even tell you personally from the news articles. Mm -hmm that I get from my Google Alerts, mm -hmm. it was 
about half of what they used to be. Mm -hmm. And now I'm really curious of what does 2017 look like for actually mm -hmm. fixing this problem or actually making moves? Uh, well, I mean, you can see. I mean, you saw that just the election alone tell, tells you. <laughs> I mean, you weren't going to go into that, but I know that's what that's what you're thinking, but you did, just didn't want to say it. But, I mean, I, I think... I'm fearful yeah. that a lot of the projects that Obama put in place uh, will fall by the wayside. Um, I'm... I'm hopeful that um, I'm hopeful that people, once people saw that the opposition was was being mobilized the way it was, um, that people understood what the possibilities were and created contingency plans for it. But you know, it's just not. But that was the other thing. Mm -hmm. I, I hope people understand that we have to continue to show up. Mm -hmm. We have to continue to support. Mm -hmm. So you can't have another White House lawn mm -hmm. tech event and we don't show up because mm -hmm. that defeats the purpose. Mm -hmm. So if they put the plans in place, we got to continue to move forward mm -hmm. with them. Um, but that goes in to say you have now one mentor, mm -hmm. one key person that you can put in your life that totally accessible. You have outreach to them. They respond to every call, every email, funding, anything you need. Mm -hmm. One person you can pick. Who would that be? Yeah. Oh, yay. Um, who would that be? I think it would be. Can, oh, can I have three? Nope, one. Damn. Just one. I'm sorry. Wow. Um, one person. Oprah Winfrey. Oprah. Mm -hmm. I don't even have to ask why. It all makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Especially for you. It all makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So now we have that in place. There's a soundtrack mm -hmm. to your life, mm -hmm. or at least there's a soundtrack for what you've been going through for the last year. Mm. What's that song or what's that album to represent? Oh, that album. Um, you know, I was so thankful. I was so thankful when this Tribe Called Quest album came out. Okay, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, so I would say for now, because I can't really think about anything else, but at the time when everything was happening, it came out at the perfect time. I was like, "This said is therapy." A lot. Yeah, it said a lot. Like, this is the therapy I needed. Like, everything was people, pe people that were influential to me in my life growing up were passing away, right. and these were people that were making songs when that, that made up. me feel empowered. And and so, when everything was happening with the election and and just personal my things, my personal life, and then the Tribe Called Quest album came out, I was like, "Okay." This is just my, my little silver lining to get me through the rest of this year. And so I would say for, for like right now, that's what it would be. So we're at this part, mm -hmm. let's say you're getting ready to retire. Mm -hmm. um, everything's coming down. You just want to slow down and change the pace of life. Mm -hmm. What's the legacy that you would like to leave behind? What's the legacy you would like people to know you for? Mm -hmm. I, I'm hoping people would have thought of me as a compassionate person, as um, somebody who through my project um, helped them build their own careers and help them uh, take care of themselves. I'm, I, I'm, I'm hoping that PRISM becomes large enough that it really does create sustainability and economic growth for creative people. That makes sense. Uh, so looking right into our main camera here, if you could please, just tell the people how they can reach you and how they can get in contact with you. You can just be your social media accounts or however you feel. Okay. So um, uh, my name is Mikhail Solomon. You can uh, find me on Instagram at Mikhail Solomon. Um, um, Twitter is at Mikhail Solomon. And you can also find Prism Art Fair on Twitter as at Prism Art Fair, and that's P-R-I-Z as in Zebra, M as in Mary, Art Fair. Um, you can also find us on Facebook, you can find us on LinkedIn, any platform, social media platform you could possibly think of, we're probably on it. So Prism Art Fair, and then you can also find me on all those platforms. So we have a tradition at Digital Grass whenever we have a meeting. Um, it's kind of a way to just let everything go. Mm -hmm. So what we would like for you to do is just give us one word to close us out with. Um, nothing more. It's not a phrase. It's not a sentence. It's not a hyphenate. 
one word that you would like to close us out with, you're just gonna look straight ahead and tell the camera. Progress. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.